<clears throat> okay, so if uh, you may have been able to hear that, but we are going to be recording tonight's event and it will be made possible for other people to listen to on our library website or, or watch. Um, and I just want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this special opportunity to hear Eva Olson speak. I know many of you have heard of Eva or about Eva, but haven't actually had the chance to hear her speak for yourself. So we're very happy you can be a part of the audience tonight. My name is Mandy Dart. Um, I'm a library clerk at Gravener's Public Library and I'm very pleased to be introducing Eva tonight. Before we get started, um, I'm going to read our land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge that the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis people were and are still the keepers and caretakers of the land and waters upon which the town of Gravenhurst now sits, which is covered by the Williams Treaty and the One Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We are deeply grateful for the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples who have shaped and strengthened this community for the benefit of future generations. And we are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect. That does tie in nicely with our evening since Eva's all about peace and reconciling with her past. So that's a nice tie in. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I've already mentioned that we're going to be recording tonight's event. Um, your cameras and microphones are off. It's great. And if you do have questions for Eva, we can address those at the end of the presentation. If you could type your question into the chat, then we will read You would them. read it. Yes, we will read them to you, right, Eva? Okay, yeah. If that works for yeah. you? Yes, yes. Okay. And I'm just gonna do a little bit of a bio about Eva. She's gonna tell you about her experience in the Holocaust, but just a little bit of a statistics uh, list here. So since 1996, Eva has given more than 4,300 presentations um, in schools, churches, meeting halls. She's presented to First Nations people, she's presented she was a guest speaker at the United Nations. And in your estimation, Eva, you've reached more than 2 million people through your presentations. Now you can correct me if any of those statistics need to be updated, but sounds good so far? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, she's received over 15,000 letters from students responding mm -hmm. to her presentations. Um, She's present, been presented with honorary degrees from multiple universities and has been honored with countless other awards for her passionate commitment to peace education. And this past October, she was given special recognition on her 97th birthday from Yad Vashem, which is Israel's Holocaust Museum and Memorial for her tireless work educating students for the past two decades. And most recently, as many of you are aware, Eva was named to the Order of Canada this past January, which I believe is a superb crowning achievement for Eva. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And thank you. That's all I'm going to say because I would like Eva to be able to share her remarkable story with you. So thank you so much, Eva, for joining us. And thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And I really appreciate having me do this because it's important, not just for the young generations to be aware of the power of hate, but all of us, no matter what age we are at. Because I had a 12 year old boy, I still have the letter, wrote to me that I talk about to eliminate hate. And he said this in his letter. Well, my mom always yells. She said, I hate when you leave your backpack in the hallway. Now, how much more productive would it be for a 12-year-old boy to hear his mother say, would you mind putting it over there? 
the point I'm trying to make here that we have a responsibility, all parents, to our children, to send them to school the way you want to see them as adults, because the teachers can't fix it. It's our responsibility. So I would like to talk about what happened. I was born in Hungary in October 1924. There were six children in my family, four girls, two boys. Three of them were already married. So I had five little nieces. And that's what brought me to unlocking my doors because for 50 years, it was locked, I was silent. I didn't speak. Silent, I found out, did not heal me. Healing is part of sharing. So my five little nieces, three years of age to two months of age, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, a one-year-old, six months and a two months. But there were one and a half million children that died age, until age 15 or 16, depending on the size. Why did they die? Because they were haters. Why were they haters? For their religious beliefs. So 11 million people died. Six of them were of my tribe. Five million were not. Anyone that that regime did not like have done away with. So where did it all begin? Jan, how do I get this slide? I pressed the one you told me to, but it didn't move. I did. Okay, thank you, thank you. You see, Mandy, why I can't do it for my house? That's no, thank you, Jan, thank you, Jan. <laughs> okay. Now, I would like to touch upon a little bit about leadership, okay? And here are two famous leaders, which should be familiar to most of the audience. Gandhi of India, Hitler, was Austrian, but became chancellor of Germany. Gandhi led his people to freedom. He fought the rebels. Hitler was also a famous leader. His agenda was different. So let's see what he did. He said children, boys of age 10 and girls were taken from their home without permission from the parents, put them in boot camps. If parents didn't allow, they were shot on spot. They became the Hitler youth. 
I met some of them. A matter of fact. Alan, what? come here for a sec. In my autobiography, I wrote about four. Two female guards and two male guards. They were trying to help us. Secretly, because they were scared. So what does it feel like for a parent when their child is taken away from them and they have no power over it? That's how it was. Okay, Hungary during World War II. That circle, inside that circle is where I was born. The dark green is Romania now. It used to be Hungary, but during World War II, Romania occupied that part. So my dad was Romanian. My mom was part of the Austrian Empire, Hungary. We heard about the war in Poland. Poland was occupied. Scared. My parents are very scared. But they didn't want to tell us anything to frighten us, as most parents are. What happened? March the 19th, 1944. Early in the morning, my dad came home from the synagogue, told my mom, there were soldiers walking on the street with a different color uniform. They knew what happened. Three weeks to that day, in April 44, they created a ghetto. There were 13,000 Jewish people living in the city I was born. 11,000 were brought in from the villages. 24,000 people were locked up. The ghetto. We lived behind there, in that area. It was mostly populated with Jewish people, poor people. That's where we lived. My mom and dad didn't have money to buy a house. In fact, I would like to share a video because this is adult. My mom and dad got married six months before the first war ended. They lived in a winterized shed. No electricity, no indoor plumbing. Now they had three children. Sarah was four, Martin was two, and Regina was seven months old. And she got pregnant with this one. Very ill. The doctor ordered her to have an abortion. My mom refused to have an abortion. She stayed in bed eight months. so that I can share her courage with you and love for a human life. And above all, never to give up hope. That's what I learned from my mom. And now people are being brought in to the ghetto from the villages. We took in a family with five children. There were 17 of us in two rooms, sleeping on the floor. No electricity, no indoor plumbing. We had a wooden toilet outside for 17 people. But it was okay, because I had a mom, 
and I had a dad. And I had three sisters and two brothers and the five little girls, the nieces. It didn't last very long. May the 15th, Hungarian Jews had ordered to be, they were shipped Auschwitz-Birken. Now what they told us to pack our bags, they said, you're being shipped to Germany to work in a brick factory. And as they loaded us onto the boxcars, I said to my mom, there's nowhere to sit here. Everybody's standing, four days and nights standing. One pail of water for a hundred people. And the other pail is you pull your pants down. Well, I was raised in a family where I never saw my two brothers in underwear. Now you have to pull your pants down to have a pee in front of strangers. I still see the images of my mom. As she found a corner in the boxcar, she was squatting down, hugging my sister Sarah's three little girls, Hedy, Judy, Kathy, and Hedy, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old. My sister, Sarah, passed away in January. My mom looked after those three little girls. She was crying. Why are you crying, Mom? I asked her. I'm not crying for me, she said. I have lived. She was 48. She said, I'm crying for all of the children. Nobody knew at that time. But next day we'll bring nobody. Hungarian Jews are having a dash with Birkenau. As we got out of the boxcar, People had a sigh of relief. Now we're going to have water and fresh air. There was neither. The sky was covered with black smoke coming out of five chimneys. And people were calling for water, water, water. And the guards were yelling at them. You're going to have a shower. When you come out, you're going to have water and coffee. They never walked out of there. They were pulled out. So they ordered us to separate from the man. And we are both they are moving on one end and we are at the other, but at the same direction towards the gate where the angel of death was standing, Joseph Mengele. He didn't speak to us. He just pointed in the direction he wanted us to go, left or right. And then so he decided who will live or who shall die. Beside me was my younger sister, Ilona. She was the youngest of the six children. Not quite 17, but she was a big girl. Those that were short and thin, the young ones went to the left. Why we were separated from our families, the elderly, pregnant women, all to the left. I couldn't understand why. I turned my head to the left. I wanted to see my mom.
Her name was Leah. I didn't see her, but at that moment, I didn't know that I will never see her again. I didn't know where she was sent with her grandchildren. My sister Regina, she with her baby, my brother's wife with her baby, they were all went to the left. And some of us to the right. The moment that I didn't see my mom, a sadness that came over me had never left me. Never. Because I wanted to hug her. I wanted to tell her I love her. I wanted to tell my mom, I'm sorry, I disobeyed you, which I did. Sometimes I went to bed crying and there was no good thing to do. But it was too late. When I speak in the school to your children, I tell them, don't ever go to bed angry. Tell your mom you love her while you can. It was too late for me. My father, he wasn't sent to the left. He was sent to the right as a slave laborer. Buchenwald. My dad, I have known him for 19 years, but I had never, ever seen him even having a cold. Never. If all the family from my father's side, the men were very healthy. Even my great-grandfather lived 104 in the mountains in Transylvania. My dad was never sick. My grandfather died in the gas chamber at 78. My dad only lived six months. Not because he was sick. He died of starvation. No food, no water. He died in December of 1944, the same month. He would have been 49 years of age. His children, the beautiful faces. They waited two hours before they died in the forest. A grandmother, just like my own grandma, she doesn't realize she's walking towards the gas chamber. They didn't realize that. In 2007, I returned to hell with a filmmaker from Toronto. His name is Don Gray. His wife, Yvonne, she was a teaching nursing in Toronto. And my book editor from our local high school in Bracebridge, Ron Jakes. The four of us. We went into the gas chamber because we wanted to see the shower head from where water was supposed to come out. But instead of water, powder zyklon B, a chemical that settles on the floor and forms a gas. And after 20 minutes, they're dead. There were five crematoriums. Some of them had to be burned that way. 
because there wasn't enough room. The small ones held a thousand, the big ones held two thousand. Eventually, when the Russians liberated Auschwitz, which was actually this January 27, 77 years ago, 77 years ago that the Russian forces liberated Auschwitz. My sister and I were not there anymore. We were already slave laborers. I will talk about that after. They found that there was no food, so they took the liver out and they ate it. Cannibalism. Dr. Joseph Mengele's experiment hospital, where they experimented on 4,000 twins. 90% of those children were done experiment on. A boy will never be a father, and a girl will never be a mother. Approximately 148 survived out of the 4,000. Female slave laborers. This female slave laborers have been there already since 1942 from Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. They were allowed to keep their shoes and socks and underwear. In 1944, when we got there, we weren't allowed. Just the prison dress, no socks, no shoes, no underwear. They took us to the Hungarian women's camp. Four thirty every morning roll call. It didn't matter what the weather was like. We had to stand two hours. Then they took us in and gave us a daily ration. One piece of bread, seventy percent sawdust. You had to make a choice. If you wanted to live, you ate it. It was so dry, you can hardly swallow. Soup, a small metal mug. We called it the dirty water soup. Why was it dirty? It was made out of the peeling of the potatoes that were not washed. One day, they ordered us to go outside in the afternoon. They told us we were about to receive the tattoo on the arm. As one guard said, now you're going to be dehumanized. You're only a number. Well, I have news for you. I don't have a number and I'm human. Well, we lined up and before they started with that procedure, half a dozen German civilian businessmen arrived they needed slave laborers, 2,000. We didn't get numbers. My sister and I were among them, and there was a blessing to get away from the smell of human flesh burning. They took us to a city called Düsseldorf. They dumped us in a soccer field. And where did we sleep? On the ground underneath pop tents. It didn't matter how much it rained overnight or what. We had a blanket. You can lie on the blanket or you cover yourself with it. Either way, if it's raining, you would be wet. 4.30 in the morning, they marched us down to the river. This was the River Rhine, where we had to unload bricks that came in on freight ship. 
a few weeks later, a mini selection, 520, my sister and I included, were taken to the capital of the Rhine, Essen, where we had to work for the Krupp manufacturers. They were manufacturing ammunition. So the top of that factory is already bombed off. The Allies were bombing, nighttime, daytime. We were glad they came, but we were scared. And they put us in a stop camp near a cold mine out at the other end of the city. Every morning early, we will march to the factory. Back in the evening, we always walked till it got dark. And now we're into October 1944. We arrived at the camp and we had a big surprise. Smoke and rubbish were waiting. All the buildings were made out of wood and burned to the ground. That day, the Allies had thrown small little bombs called phosphorus bombs. As they fall, they ignite light up like a match and spread like wildfire. All the buildings had burned to the ground, including the kitchen. Underneath the kitchen was a dirt hole and they put it down in that dirt hole. No light, no nothing, totally black. There was some straw down there. And we thought at the old fashioned root cellar, we didn't have freezers those days. We had root cellars. Maybe they stored the root vegetables on the straw down there. Four days and nights, we slept on that straw. Those young female prisoners did not go outside after it got dark for fear. By that time, we knew what the bullies were doing. They were raping the female prisoners. So the straw was used as a toilet where we slept. The conditions, some of the girls got sick. We found out it was tuberculosis. Six days before the Allies came in, and even before then, people got very sick. The Gestapo had given orders, zero supply. So what does that mean? No food, no what, nothing, zero. Approximately 500 died every day. This is the final journey. Because the Russians were coming closer. They didn't want us to be free. As I mentioned in the beginning, that when the Russians occupied Auschwitz, we were already gone here. Bergen-Belsen, where Anne Frank, the Dutch girl, and her sister Margo died. The barrack my sister and I, I ended up in, there wasn't a chair to sit on, a bunk to lie on. All prisoners were on the floor. What kind of floor? A floor that was covered with eskimos. These prisoners were very, very sick. They've been there already for a long time. Typhoid fever became an epidemic. Lice.
Bergen-Belsen was built to hold 5,000 5, soldiers pre-war. And they put 60,000 of us in there. Drinking water from the trenches. I'm lying on the floor very, very sick with a high fever. My sister beside me. Here's what I kept saying to myself. I cannot die here. Who's going to look after my sister? There's no one left. But then we knew that our parents were gone. Close to three years younger than myself. She's my responsibility, so I cannot die. So here's what happened. Because I took my mind off myself and was concerned about my younger sister, the baby of the family. Not being concerned about me. Yet, Unknowingly, I helped myself. I wasn't concerned about my sickness. And that's how I got better. That's what Bergen Belgian looked like. Mountains, hills of them. I remember seeing two prisoners, male prisoners, pulling corpses and put them in the trenches. And that man recognized me. He was the pharmacist in our, our city where I was born. He was asking if I'd seen his wife. They never had children. I said, no, I had never seen. You saw the other person immediately. They asked, have you seen someone of my family? I didn't. Liberation, April 15, 1945. The British were the main forces. Canadians came in from Holland. They liberated Holland first. I remember the soldiers, and I wouldn't know at that time. Today, I would recognize their cap. But one bent down and put a red cross on my forehead. But he went to others as well. He went to those that were not skeletoned at that point. We were the ones that came there towards the end from work, being a slave laborer. The ones with the Red Cross were taken to a tent to be disinfected. Outside Bergen boundaries, they converted the military building to a hospital. That's where I found out why I was so sick. And that's when my sister got the fever as well. Couple of months in the hospital, the Swedish Red Cross arrived to give us some advice. And it's written in Swedish, Roda Röda Korset. They were very, very helpful in every way. Financially, you want to go back where you were born, they pay your fare. You want to go to Switzerland, they take you there. Or Sweden. And I made a choice for my sister as well. I made a choice, Sweden. When I arrived in Sweden, I had the feeling I was taken out of hell into heaven. The Swedish people were not concerned with the religion. 
color, our culture. They mentioned that there are six races. Our concern is one race, that's the human race that we are a part of. What our pigmentation is, our shape of eyes, or where we pray or who we pray to, should have no effect on any one of us. The only thing that affects every one of us is the way we treat each other. Life is not about I, it's not about me, it's about we. We, together as a people, we can make a difference. Now we're in October 1945. I picked up the language a little bit. I speak Swedish now. I met the young man, Rudy. And he wanted to date me. And I told him, you must date a Swedish girl because I'm different. And here is what I learned from him. It's okay to be different, he said. What's not okay, it's when we are indifferent. That's not okay. I did not fall in love with him. I built my love for him. By watching his, seeing his compassion the character, acceptance of others. Because after all, that's what matters. If that's not there in a relationship, it's not worth anything. And that led to the altar. Finding freedom in Sweden after liberation, the power of accepting individual differences. The next picture is my sister, Ilona. She passed away four years ago, and they were sad because the only two that survived. And the challenge is be a leader by being a role model. And isn't that the truth? Because what our children learn from us, as I said, they take with them to school. That's a factor. Thank you so very much for giving me this great opportunity. What it does for me, it keeps my, the spirit of my family alive. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. I don't know, I'm speechless right now. I'm still got all the goosebumps from listening to your story again. Um, if anyone has questions at this point for Eva, there's a, a lot more to the story and we can check in the chat. Um, if anyone wants to type in some questions, I can read them to Eva. Thank you. Um, the first question I'm seeing here, Eva, is somebody wants to know how you ended up in Bracebridge. I drove up <laughs> from Richmond Hill. <laughs> But how we ended up in Canada in 1951 to Halifax, Nova Scotia. We came as tourists for six months. And my husband liked Canada very much. He was a Swede. Reminded him of Northern Sweden where he was born 
and he decided to stay. So then we settled for five years in Montreal. Our son was born there. And then he got a job in his profession, engineering. He had to sign that he was willing to be moved to Toronto. And that's how we ended up in Ontario. Yes. The next question is about your uh, sister. And one person would like to know how she died. Well, she died in Israel, in Tel Aviv. And she had all damage. And last October, she died four years ago, last October, David, her, who was a professor at Hemoglobe, he died last October. He was 100. There are a lot of wonderful comments here, Eva, that I'll just read while um, people might potentially be writing another question, but somebody said that it was, um, Somebody said that they've heard your story more than once and that they are moved to tears each time. Um, and I personally was mentioning how I had goosebumps the whole time. Um, but somebody else also wrote that it was still as impactful hearing it 25, as it was yes. hearing it 25 years ago in grade seven. Yes. So that's great that we've got somebody who heard you as a student. Yeah, oh, yes, yes. Yes, that's so nice. Um, we do have a question. How did you find out about the deaths of your parents? Oh, about my mom that was, as we went, they put us in, in the barrack. And they were students already, prisoners already. Uh, in particular, Levan from Czechoslovakia, she's been there already for two years. And I said, when are we going to see her mom and dad? And she said, are you crazy? You see those chimneys where the smoke is coming out? You're never going to see them. Hmm. It didn't uh, sugarcoat it, I guess. Yeah. She was just telling you the truth. Wow, that's pretty, pretty uh, brutally honest. Yeah. It's unbelievable for us to imagine. Um, and after the fact, you were able to do some research to find out about your parents? Oh, I didn't need to do research, no. No, okay. No. Or like where your dad ended yeah. up? Or well, we, I was still there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. We have somebody who just wanted to know what you do to handle the bad days when they come. The bad days? Yeah. Well, I think about when I had good days. So you have to find a balance. how blessed I was that I was able to meet someone like Rudy and for 19 years, beautiful marriage and a great son out of that love. The tragedy that he was driving to work from Richmond Hill to Toronto, somebody was drinking and driving and hit him. And two and a half years later, he passed away from those injuries before he was 38. Um, a big question from somebody else. Uh, what do you think we as people can do in 2022 to be proactive to ensure that hate doesn't grow its roots once again? 
acceptance. Replace hate with love, compassion, and acceptance. It maybe sounds a big word, acceptance. But if there is no acceptance, if I don't accept you, then the relationship is over, right? There is no relationship. How we, how we build the relationships, whether it's community, a school, a classroom, a gym, a, the soccer field, whatever. It's by accepting it. If there are issues, yes, let's sit down and talk about it, see how we can resolve them. It's no different than being married to someone. There are issues sometimes, there, there are various for different reasons. I'm not gonna slam the door and start running. Let's sit down and see how can we resolve this. We have a specific question about whether you know somebody named Willie Mall or Mole. Um, said he spent time in the Nalabaki forest. Does any of this ring a bell to you? No. Okay. With the Bielski brothers. Doesn't sound familiar to you? No. Okay. I wasn't sure. Um, there was another person, I, I'm not sure if you're keeping up with being able to read all this, but somebody who met you 22 years ago when you spoke at the Learning Center and this and person. Betty. And Betty. Um, possibly somebody who spoke in Swedish with you because that person had lived in Sweden for eight years. Oh, it rings a bell, yes. Yeah, <laughs> just thought I'd mention that. Um, I don't see any other questions. Did anyone else have anything else that they wanted to ask Eva before we close off for the evening? I do have one question just because forgiveness is such a hard thing um, in our lives and we didn't live quite, I didn't live quite the drastic Life okay. that you live. So yeah. forgiveness, I don't know, is that an ongoing No, thing? I have I have been asked that. Right. Uh, I have forgiven those that harmed me. I cannot forgive for what they did to eleven million people. That's not my job. I have forgiven those, not for their sake, for my sake, because I need to heal. If I carry hate in my heart, it's difficult to heal. And is it something that comes up and you have to kind of re-forgive over and over? Yeah. yeah. You don't like me? That's your problem, not mine. I like me. Yeah, very true. And I'm not, I don't want to hog the questions, but my, my other one was about being silent. So you did not speak about the Holocaust for how many years? 50. So 50 years. Yes. You didn't talk to anybody about it? True. Okay. Um, we do have a question from somebody who wanted wanted you to tell us about the family member that had difficulty with your marriage because your husband was not Jewish. That's my sister, Ilona, because she was the only one that survived with me. Yes. Yes. So there was never, for 76 years, there was no connection between us. But you know what I would like to say to this person that had the question? 
I married a human being, not a religion. I married someone for their love and compassion and acceptance, not religion. It, religion is okay if it's used as it meant to be for the spiritual values. Judging someone is not being spiritual. Very well said. Well, we do want to thank you. And um, if anyone, well, we want to thank you very much, Eva. And thank you. Please pass along our thank you to Jan for helping with the technology, which thank went you. very smoothly. Um, and as people may know, Eva has three books that are available. So if you do want information about purchasing the books, you can contact the library and we can give you lots of details on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Eva, for coming. And Thank you. great to see your face and hear your voice. Same here. Yeah. And on behalf of the Graveners Public Library, thank you to all the participants for, for, for joining. Thank you.